Okay, so I feel like with this talk we are supposed to be very didactic. Um, my punchline is the same for all of my cases. We started enteral nutrition and, um, and they improved, hopefully. Um, so what I thought was gonna be very practical is to look at real case scenarios and how we used enteral nutrition at our hospital. So when we started our enteral nutrition therapy program, our exclusive enteral nutrition therapy program, um, we did it when we were using a lot of 6 purine, and I think in the pediatric world there's been a little bit of, of a tendency to turn away from that, and so in our traditional sense, we don't spend as much time, or we don't see as many people, okay, we don't see as many people um, that are moving to 6 purine, and so there are different clinical scenarios that we find that this would be appropriate use as well. So I'm just gonna start with this typical patient. So we have a 17-year-old iliocolonic disease in moderate severity. We want to induce her and avoid using steroids. Let's put her case scenario that prom is coming up and she didn't wanna be cushionoid and she didn't wanna gain weight and she didn't wanna get acne, so we start her on exclusive enteral nutrition, and at the very get-go, we also start 6-MP. And I showed you this algorithm, this roadmap. We started talking to her about using, you know, ramping up, starting the 6-MP, seeing if she was in clinical remission, keeping her on that dose for 12 weeks, and then slowly tapering off as we note that our 6-TG metabolites are within the therapeutic range. And so this person successfully then was able to wean from nutrition therapy, had induction with nutrition therapy, and went to 6-MP for maintenance therapy. This was an afterthought slide because as I said, this is not our typical scenario in which we use this anymore. So let's talk about some other cases. So we have AM, diagnosed um, at 13 years of age with Crohn's disease in 2012. Crohn's disease was iliocolonic plus upper disease. And they had tried 6-MP and steroids, but they didn't achieve a prolonged remission with the steroid wean. So they were scoped, there was no improvement. We started Remicade and methotrexate. In 2014, he had fevers of 104 degrees for greater than a week, abdominal pain, and headaches leading him to the hospital. He was admitted for nine days, had a large workup, including infectious disease, rheumatology, oncology, and I live in Ohio. So my reality is that histoplasmosis is a real thing and patients can get very sick when they have histoplasmosis, and we can't continue their immunosuppression on this uh, when they have histoplasmosis. He started itraconazole, and you have to be on that for a whole year. So what are we gonna do with those patients? Do we just say, well, let's roll the dice and keep our fingers crossed and hope that you don't have a flare in your IBD during this time that you can be on no therapy? So we had, you know, the recommendations from ID is stay off immunosuppression as long as possible. And so we thought, well, I think this might be a really good clinical scenario to start exclusive enteral nutrition. And so we were able to maintain remission for this patient for the duration of the time that they had to be on itraconazole. And actually, he did so well that he stayed on exclusive enteral nutrition for three years. Um, unfortunately, he developed perianal disease. And so we had to restart Remicade because exclusive ventral nutrition is not deemed to be appropriate in somebody with perianal disease. It was an extension of his disease while on this therapy. But we were able to give him some time so that we had good control of his histo. His titers were not detectable. And so with the help of our infectious disease 
doctor, we were able to safely restart Remicade, but we follow him very closely, and infectious diseases follows him very closely, and we're monitoring his histotiters all the time. So from the audience, is there anybody who has had a clinical scenario like this? And if so, have you used nutrition therapy? No experience with that? Okay. All right. So our next case is BB, a 19-year-old with ileal Crohn's disease. We started at Enteral Nutrition at Diagnosis, and um, they, have, they chose to continue this therapy as maintenance therapy. So over time, I showed you that algorithm. We have the induction algorithm, and then we have the maintenance algorithm. And we think when people do well and have, in, and have um, achieved remission through induction therapy, we can wean how much exclusive enteral nutrition therapy they need to take during every day. Now, some people will choose to have their patients be on 90 or 100% nutrition therapy six days a week and eat whatever they want one day a week. And if they do well with that, then we say, well, five days a week do exclusive enteral nutrition and then two days a week eat whatever you want to eat. And we follow these patients closely. We follow their biochemical markers. And with him, we repeated his scope, and there was no active inflammation. Well, as most patients do, they sort of liberalized their diet even further, and was they were kind of really doing like maybe a, a nutrition shake or two and eating whatever they wanted to the rest of the time. So they were really kind of on no therapy because 30% of their calories were coming from nutrition therapy and 70 from other foods. And they started having some symptoms with some increased fatigue, and we saw the calprotectin was rising. So we have a conversation with those people. Does this mean that for this patient, enteral nutrition therapy is, is a failure, that we have to go to more aggressive therapy? What, what would you guys think? Would you say this just doesn't work for you? You can't handle it? So there are, are, are a few options, and some people may say, if you can't be adherent with your therapy, then we're gonna put you on Remicade, or we're gonna put you on 6-MP or methotrexate. So you have to have frank discussions with your patients. And so he agreed that he was going to go back to 70-30, for his diet because that's what he felt like he could really maintain. And sometimes, you know, life just happens and you're kind of feeling so great. I mean, that's why a lot of our patients stop taking their medicines, right? So it's the same thing in enteral nutrition. They're gonna just eat more calories of their food. And so he went back on the 70-30 protocol and within a few months, his calprotectin has decreased, his sed rate is normal, and his CRP is normal. So in this case, somebody, they liberalized their diet a little bit too much, so we just put them back on what was working for him. If 70-30 didn't work, would you guys think about doing 80-20, 90-10, just abandon it? So show of hands, is there anybody here who generally uses nutrition therapy just for a baseline. Oh. Wow. Okay. You should come up and join me. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a perfect talk. So let me just go through these case scenarios then so that I can show you in your practice how you could actually use these. Use this, I should say. All right. MC, 19-year-old diagnosed with iliocolonic Crohn's disease in 2011, started steroids and 6-MP, and he did well until 2013 when he had a flare. We checked his 6-MP metabolites. His 6-TG was therapeutic. So for this patient, do we all agree that we're going to have to do some sort of therapy change if he's got therapeutic 6-TG levels? And so we would escalate. It was 
2013, we would be escalating to infliximab at that time. And our patient said, you know what? Like, I just always feel like I'm in a fog. So I don't really want to take these medicines. I think that it's the medicine that is causing me to feel this way. So how about I choose enteral nutrition? Okay, so that's a big dis discussion. You know, like we think maybe his disease is too severe and we think that he should, he should go to, to Remicade, but we said, okay, you know what? If you want to try nutrition therapy, we can give that a try for a while. He wasn't super sick. We weren't thinking about needing to hospitalize him. And so he chose general nutrition for induction and maintenance, and he did great. It worked for him. He got to avoid starting infliximab at that time. And he weaned himself down to about 50-50 split. So half of his calories for, were from nutrition shakes and half were just whatever he wanted to eat. And he could do that for two years. And then he flared. So he said, no, I just want to go back to 100% of exclusive enteral nutrition. We said, you know what, you, you got to have something else. He did not want to go to Remicade. We said, Let's try methotrexate, right? This is your shared decision making with your families. And so we give them all of the options. And so he started methotrexate, went back to 100% exclusive enteral nutrition. And starting that methotrexate, he said, I just don't feel right. It just, it wasn't that this was a family that was averse to doing medication therapy. They tried it. He just didn't feel good. And honestly, his biochemical markers didn't really improve significantly when he was on those medicines. So, so he stopped methotrexate. He stayed on exclusive enteral nutrition alone until he felt better and then until we saw an improvement in his set rate, his CRP, and his calprotectin. And over time, and this kid and their family, has be, they've become foodies. They are our... Uh, they just talk to everybody about diet and its interactions in inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease. They came and gave us a lecture the other, like uh, several months ago at our Improved Care Now meeting because they are so knowledgeable about food at this time. So they decided that it was very difficult to maintain 100% exclusive enteral nutrition. So he started trying the specific carbohydrate diet, and that was several years ago. We didn't really have, like, we didn't feel very confident in being able to explain what all they needed to do for the SCD diet. I did a ton of research on their own, and he has been the best he has ever been. His scopes are normal. His labs are normal. If he starts verging away too far from the specific carbohydrate diet, he feels his symptoms. He may go on to a little bit of enteral nutrition. He tightens up his reins with the SCD diet, and he has managed his disease beautifully. He looks fantastic. He's happy. This is a great option for this kiddo who just really felt like the medicines when he took them, whether it be placebo effect or whether it be real, he just didn't feel the same. And for him, this would be like if we said, you can only take a pill, he would be very non-adherent with that pill because it made him feel really miserable. All right. Next case study. So we have OM, four-year-old male, diagnosed with Crohn's disease in late July 2015. So he's a very early onset patient with IBD. He was diagnosed at 18 months of age. He had pancolitis, duodenitis, and gastritis. And for him, um, he went on enteral nutrition. I have his growth curves here. He was really, you know, he was on the bottle. He was just starting to wean, having symptoms. So for him to go back on to enteral, to switch from his formula to uh, an enteral therapy was not hard at all. This was a kiddo who was so little, he doesn't have the same food experience that we have of that whole socialization, right? So his entire world was not associated with going out with friends and having a great dinner and big celebrations on his birthday of every kind of possible food imaginable. So for him, he is on enteral nutrition. He does 80-20, eats a little bit of food, but to be honest, the food piece of it is just not a big deal for him because from a young age, he was just on nutrition therapy. So for him, for his mother, 
this completely works, might seem like it would be hard for a four-year-old, that they might want to do a bunch of stuff. And perhaps as he advances through school, we might have to rethink his treatment. We might just be able to work with the schools and look at party days and see what he can eat and sort of accommodate that into his diet therapy for that day. But this has worked really great. And we can see from his growth curves that he is not lacking at all in, in his um, height or weight velocity. Anybody have anything that they would add as considerations for his case? Okay. So I have all of these abbreviations with um, all of these case studies, and they are real people, and I like, have to remember who this kid is to remember my case scenario. Um, CWH, he's a 12-year-old, presented with two weeks of right lower quadrant abdominal pain, intermittent diarrhea, fevers, and he had a distant relative that had inflammatory bowel disease. His imaging showed an inflamed appendix, but otherwise his imaging looked, he, he was fine and he looked well. So he was sent home on antibiotic therapy in 10 days with a planned follow-up visit with GI. We did stool infectious studies that were negative. When he came to see us, follow-up imaging um, showed that he had an abscess and progressive pretty serious disease. A drain was placed. He had a pick line put in. IV antibiotics were started. And we knew that this kiddo needed an uh, ileocecal resection, ileocolonic resection, right? But what were we going to do? He was newly diagnosed. He's been on no therapy. His symptoms are getting worse. Do we just need to stare at him? If we put, you know, we could do um, TPN, but then you have some risks associated with that. His fistula that was leading to his abscess wasn't so big that all of his nutrition was going through there. So we started him on exclusive enteral therapy while we were waiting for surgery. Is that a real indication? I mean, it was something that we felt like we could do when he was tolerating it. Had he been throwing up, unable to tolerate it, feeling sicker, this wouldn't have been the right situation to start this in. But those were not, that was not what was happening with him. So he developed a reaction to his medications. He had to be on steroids for five days because of that interaction, and so surgery was delayed even further. So this was somebody who, if we just sat and watched him, he would have absolutely no therapy. We would be sending him into surgery, really the worst possible scenario, because he's got a hot inflamed belly and um, he could have poor surgical outcomes. So in him, he was on exclusive enteral nutrition for about three and a half weeks before surgery was done. And then that was um, how we confirmed inflammatory bowel disease. And so we continued this as a bridge until a few weeks after surgery when we felt like things were calmed down and he was a safe candidate to start Remicade therapy. So this is not somebody that, you know, at first glance you would think, oh, we should think about nutrition therapy for this patient. But you can see how it can apply. We know that good nutrition improves outcomes with surgery. So we should think about that in cases like this. Questions about that? thought that that could be a, a fairly controversial slide. Oh, all right. AL, 13-year-old diagnosed at age six with colonic Crohn's disease. She had granulomas. She was start, started on prednisone and 6-MP, and she was never in great remission. Her labs would fluctuate every time we checked them. Sometimes they were good, sometimes they were bad. Um, but we knew that we really were not getting the great response that we wanted with, with uh, 6-MP. And so we eventually added Remicade to her therapy. And we quickly needed to increase. So you know, within a year's period of time, she was at uh, Remicade 10 milligrams per kilogram every four weeks, which is about as hefty as the dose of, that we give, and full dose 6-MP. Her calprotectin was still in the 800s, so we weren't really improving anything. 
So this was like, let's just do full court press, right? Let's see, is there something that we can add? Do we want to move forward with um, a colectomy? Her Crohn's disease is colonic, but she was six. We kind of think that that might progress. How many surgeries were we going to you know, do for this patient? So lo and behold, and, and again, this is a true story, we added exclusive enteral nutrition. Her symptoms improved. Her labs improved. We were able to space out her Remicade, and she remained on a modified partial enteral nutrition diet and has been doing well. And for her, she starts feeling worse. She increases back to full exclusive enteral nutrition. And when she feels better, she backs off a little bit. And I think she is the best predictor with her patient reported outcomes of how she's doing because her labs very much correlate with how she feels. And so at this point, although she is not in perfect remission all the time, sometimes her labs still fluctuate Sometimes we've scoped her and things look fantastic, and then nine months later, we have to rescope, and she's got a little bit of inflammation. The family has always opted to just focus on doing exclusive enteral nutrition, and her labs improve. So again, kind of not the typical scenario that you would think about in uh, starting exclusive enteral nutrition, but when you have all of your medicines, maximum doses, good levels, and nothing is working for the patient. And we thought we'd give it a few weeks of a try and see what happened, and lo and behold, it was working very well for her. Okay, this is interesting. So you might think that if somebody is autistic, it would be very difficult for them to be adherent with exclusive enteral nutrition. But this was a 14-year-old boy that only wanted to drink Bright Beginnings to begin with. Like, that was their preference. They were working with trying to get him to eat more foods, and he, he just didn't want it. So we ended up putting him on exclusive enteral nutrition. You can see here, his growth curve was really pathetic when we first met him, because again, here we are, we're trying to get him to eat all kinds of foods, and he just didn't, he just didn't want to do it. So when we got good nutrition on, in with exclusive enteral nutrition, we see that his growth got better. I copied his slides, or his uh, H&H. His anemia improved. He flared. He was in remission for a full year. He flared. His calprotectin was 590. He had worse symptoms and worse inflammation noted on scopes and imaging. And this was somebody that we said, you know what? This isn't controlling him. We know he only loves to take this. We didn't take him off this exclusive enteral nutrition because it was meeting his uh, nutrient needs. But he was somebody that we had to say, this just isn't the right long-term plan for him. And so we started Remicade. I think that they, he took it. If somebody was not taking it, we might take change to something that we knew that they would take. But all of the evidence suggests that all of the formulas are, are equal. So no, I wouldn't think about switching to a different formula in his case because he was able to be adherent with it. And other people, yes, it would make complete sense to do that to see if we could get him to, to drink it. Are there other thoughts about that? Okay. I think this is our last um, case study. So TV, 11-year-old, diagnosed with ileocolonic plus upper tract Crohn's disease, to really deep ulcerations throughout. So in my first talk, I said, this is probably somebody who's going to require a, a, a biologic, probably somebody who isn't going to respond well. Her sister had Crohn's disease, had been down this path. Her sister presented with an ileocolonic abscess. When we did our screening at diagnosis, we noticed that her varicella uh, zoster antibody was negative. And if you put somebody on immune suppressing medicines, we can't give them the chicken pox shot, right? Because it's a live vaccine. And so we had a conversation with the family. We said, you know, you, you're not so sick that you're being hospitalized. We could delay starting Remicade for four to six weeks. We could give you your vaccine 
You can be on exclusive enteral nutrition until then. And once we know that it's safe for us to start from a cape, that's what we're gonna do. And so that was our plan. She tolerated the enteral nutrition for four weeks. We had given her the vaccine and then we were able to start her on uh, biologic therapy without concerns and now she is protected against chickenpox. So just another scenario that you could use that. I think that, that those are all of my clinical scenarios.